Welcome to What Does an Understanding System Look Like? And this is CAD Inc. series, um, part two in the series, The New NLU Industry. Today, you're going to hear John Ball talk about the implementation of a, a continuously growing system that is 100% accurate. Today's session is pre-recorded, but we'd love to have your comments and questions in the comment section below the recording and John will respond to them later. But for now we'll um, hear now from John Ball and the what what does an understanding system look like. Thanks Beth, uh, thanks for the introduction today uh, and what we're going to do is start by talking about what's been going on in the last couple of weeks since our last live stream. Uh, and the first topic you were involved in, and that's this dialogue between uh, one of the Turing Award winners, uh, Jan LeCun, and um, the discussion about chat GPT. Um, do you, th did you have any comment on that interaction? Because I think it's quite important in terms of what we're discussing today. Yeah, the what gets lost, I think, when with all the discussion about these uh, gener generative AI systems or large language models is that they're producing a lot of text at scale and some of it's toxic, some of it's bias, some of it's misinformation. Um, what I have been constantly saying is that it's also not, um, it, it's not a solution for those goal-directed conversations that are needed by enterprise to be had, whether it's for service or sales, um, for, for consumers. And here you can see that Jan's saying, yeah, it's considerably easier to build a chatbot for entertainment or writing assistance than for your, for your accurate question answering, information retrieval, um, science or education. So I thought right. at least that establishes that and reduces the confusion that these LLMs, um, what they might be used for. Yeah, I've, I've highlighted that that quote from him as well. That they make stuff up because I, I think that's one of the uh, one of the points where people say, "Well, we're almost there. We've got this nice framework, and now all we have to do is stop it making stuff up." We, which I think is like saying, "All we have to do is completely redesign it from the the ground up." Anyway, and that's, that's what uh, you're here. That's what you're here to talk about: how we implement the systems that are continuously grow and are actually and and are accurate. Right. Great. Well, that's what I'll keep doing then. <laughs> so after our uh, discussion last week, um, there there was uh, a, some feedback here from somebody with a Cyrillic name, which was which was interesting, um, and uh, I think this is Alexander. Domenico, something like that, Alexander. Uh, and he asked a couple of questions which are really typical of the types of things people um, always talk about when we talk about um, language systems and it, its meaning. Um, so the first question was, how does your system differentiate between the meanings of, and that, that's a quote, hot in hot pepper, hot day, hot girl. Uh, and I, I answered that actually in the comments section um, last time. but. What this question is in linguistics terms is uh, predicates determine their arguments. So when you use the word hot, that's a predicate. It's describing something. Um, and in this case, if you're describing hot pepper, you're talking about spicy, probably. You could also be talking about temperature. Um, a hot day, you're probably talking about temperature because days can be hot and spicy days don't really mean anything. Uh, and then a hot girl is probably the description of sexy, but she could have just been running and been physically hot as a result of that. So um, we we can pick with an NLU system um, what the most probable one is, but you don't want to do that. You actually want it to be resolved in context. Uh, uh, his second question was, how do you resolve um, the it? In I saw a car, it was yesterday, it was red. Uh, and you know, what does it mean in this case? So uh, in the first case, it was yesterday. Um, time frames don't apply to things. So if it was yesterday, you've got to be talking about some sort of an event. Um, and the only information we have so far was I saw a car. So 
I saw a car as an entire event. It was yesterday. That was when you saw the car. Uh, it was red. Uh, events don't have colors. You know, you don't go to a red party, as far as I can tell. Uh, so um, either I'm red or the car's red. Um, and because I'm saying it was red rather than I was red, we know that it has to be referring to the car. Um, so that that's how it's resolved. It's basically the predicates determining their arguments. Kind of a boring thing to say, but uh, uh, extremely effective. Um, and then the next question was, how does your system process visiting relatives? Uh, and my, my comment was, well, that's not enough information to know for sure. Uh, but um, the, the example, because it's, uh, it's one that's often in the linguistics community, um, visiting relatives is boring. So in that case, the visiting is boring because you're the uh, the phrase they're visiting relatives is about the visiting and it just of relatives um, or visiting relatives are annoying um, in that case because you're using plural are you're referring to the relatives that are visiting being boring so so there, there's enough information um, if you have the right sentence and um, Grice's maxims which is a uh, philosophical concept or possibly psychological concept is that people don't speak to be ambiguous. Uh, so in any case, the, the answer to that was it give me a better sentence. And of course, he then came back with a, a proper linguistics response, which would be, what if you said visiting relatives can be annoying? Um, so that's, uh, in, in this case, um, still ambiguous because you can't resolve um, with a, a modal sentence like that can be. And then he says, after I don't like my house created, I don't like the climate there, my shopping bill increased. So it doesn't necessarily have to be after. It it could be at any point. The point is that when you're resolving things in context, um, the information, the knowledge about I don't like my house crowded, I don't like the climate there, my shopping bill increased, that's determining uh, more information that you can use to then resolve the rest of the sentence uh, or the rest of that yeah, that, that um, previous sentence. So, so that's just something to think about as we go forward. Context is very important. Um, so, yeah, they're meaning questions. Uh, another thing that popped up in my LinkedIn feed, in fact, this week was um, a, a thing uh, that's leveraging GPT because uh, um, those transformer models seem to be very popular at the moment. And this one was graph. GPT, uh, and you would put in a sentence, there's a sentence, um, Jerry, L Elaine, George and Kramer are friends, and the system would automatically draw up this stuff. Elaine is a friend of George, Jerry is a friend of George, so it's it's actually building a knowledge graph. Uh, and, and that then leads to the question of um, why are we doing this? Because this is, out of context, um, very ambiguous. Uh, it, you know, um, Elaine is a friend of George, and you can sort of tell if you've seen the Seinfeld show that it's talking about the four main characters there, uh, and it's it's enabling you to manipulate this knowledge graph with that technique. But the the trouble is that uh, this is a semantic network, and all of those elements are highly ambiguous. Uh, there's many people called Jerry that aren't friends of many the many people called George. Uh, if Jerry's a friend of Kramer, is Kramer a friend of Jerry? Is um, is that what the sentence actually was? So what, what we're seeing here is the loss of the meaning by simply converting it into this type of graph. Um, so it's kind of cool that there's a technology that does that, but we need to take the opportunity now to sort out the science. If you're going to show a knowledge graph, well, um, George could be a dog, Jerry could be a cat. You know, uh, It would be nice to ground a knowledge graph into something that retains its meaning after you lose that original sentence. So what, what we're talking about today is the follow on from that uh, last live stream with um, uh, uh, where it's not about scale because it's not in the data. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we're um, looking at how we do create understanding machines. We'll start with the science and then we'll move on to uh, how we do the engineering correctly. Uh, and notice here that um, the science has to lead the theory. So if we can get the right science, you can imagine for the next thousand years, you can rely on that science. I, I suspect a lot of the things, for example, that we've learned about automobiles um, 
for the last hundred years have been quite valid. There might be new ways of employing tricks, but it should continue if the science underpinning it's right. Uh, and what you want scientists to do, like um, well, Ed Saba at the last um, our last live stream, oh, live the one before, um, he's an expert in in semantics in uh, in a lot of things actually. He's he's a uh, uh, got a PhD in in this area, and you want him to come up with the things that you need to solve. Uh, him and people like that. If you can come up with all the scientific observations that you need to comply with, well, that's a much better position than ignoring the things that we know the system should do, and then just stumbling across them uh, in production. Um, and and the main uh, approach that we want in order to understand machines is to use meaning as the interlingua. So if you've got two languages, English and German, if you're storing their meaning as um, the interlingua that allows you to then generate into any other language, then uh, that's going to be a long-term solution for um, the world's languages and therefore for NLU. So our goal as engineers is to grow the system continuously with 100% accuracy. Um, and in order to do that with such a large scale endeavor, you want to uh, regularly run tests. So as you're adding new content, you want to test to make sure it's working correctly uh, and then continually test as you do other changes so that as you're adding ambiguous words, it doesn't cause other problems in the system. And you know we've, done, we've had a lot of experience, we've been doing this for a long time, but uh, that, that's the, the premise for building this, um, this lossless system. So let's move on to the science. I, I um, start with Roland Reference Grammar. It's a linguistic framework that's been around for something like 40 years. Uh, and there's a couple of key points that um, come up. Uh, the thing that makes the language work uh, is this discourse pragmatics element. So this is storing context, um, taking the form of what we say, and then using that to help us with a thing called topic and focus. It's um, a complicated concept, but... Uh, uh, discourse pragmatics is the thing that's driving language, uh, whereas sentences alone can't resolve um, language. Uh, and then we've got the semantic representation. So that's the meaning of what's being said in ideally a lossless format so that whatever you say in English can then be reproduced in any language of your interest. Uh, and then the focus really from the 1960s, which was the syntactic focus independently of those other pieces. But if you take syntax and map it to meaning and you do that in line with the rules of discourse pragmatics, then um, you're in good shape. Um, so what else have we got here? Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of examples where if you don't have context like this one, I saw her duck. Uh, it immediately asks a question, um, did you see her move because she ducked or did you see a bird, her duck? Um, so that that's a, an example, you know, a very popular example of where it's very hard to do this um, with language because of that ambiguity. But immediately humans can resolve it by simply asking a question. Um, or this one, that's a nice story. Well, that either means you just lied, that's a nice story. Um, or literally that the, the uh, tale is enjoyable. We have to be able to pick those types of differences and a science like role and reference grammar is a good starting point. Um, so th this was a plan and control loop. I, I used to be a, a program manager in enterprise. Um, I was actually an engineer for quite a while as well. Uh, and one of the things that I learned was when you're um, trying to achieve a goal in a project, uh, it's important to um, follow something like this. This is the plan and control loop um, that IBM had in the 80s. And you'll see on the far left there, there's uh, the objectives field. And in the case of NLU, our objective is to emulate humans. So natural language understanding should be emulating what people can do when they're understanding language. Uh, and then once you've got your objective, you then plan it, how to implement this human model. Uh, you then test it, you execute and test it with measurements. And then you can say, well, I'm going to control it. I'm going to change my objective because I've learned something. Uh, or you can change the plan of how you get there, or you can change your execution, or you can change your measurement so that uh, over time, you're going to hit the objectives that you finish up with. And I just contrast that with 
uh, what op often happens in science, we can say um, language is a formal model. And here's my formal model. This is the Chomsky model from the 1950s. So our objective now is to implement this formal model with parsing and uh, all the, the things that went on until the 1990s um, when computational linguistics came in. And you can set plans to uh, make your formal model work and you can execute and measure and get very frustrated because it's not working. And then with computational linguistics, you can set a model of, I'm going to use computation, I'm going to use some, some sort of statistical model um, in order to get uh, my execution to work. And if that doesn't work, you can say, I'm going to use artificial neural networks. Uh, now, an important thing is uh, at some point in our control process for science, uh, maybe you need to change the objective. But the important thing is don't ladle, um, labor your objective with some piece of engineering technology because maybe that engineering technology won't solve the problem you want. Uh, and yeah, we, let's um, uh, well let, let's just have a look. So what, one of the things which uh, human language is explained with in role and reference grammar is that it's morphosyntax uh, linked to semantics uh, within um, discourse pragmatics. Morphosyntax is uh, an important concept because in some languages, the words plus, for example, inflections have exactly the same uh, meaning that's expressed by phrases alone. So words are the smallest unit in um, in spoken language um, so we need to be able to recognize the fact that in some languages a word will contain what would otherwise be in english a number of phrases so our model needs to be quite flexible as um, comes about from studying that uh, last time uh, i talked about pattern theory and how what we want to start with in human emulation is is uh, animal brains because animal brains that then evolved into human brains um, have a lot of similarities and AI could be probably 90% solved uh, if we simply had the abilities of a dog or a cat to, to begin with because they can move, um, they can make noise, they can make decisions, they can navigate. Um, a, a lot of things that we haven't solved yet with um, today's AI systems could be solvable if we just started with um, that level of capability. Uh, but when you do the analysis and you compare what humans are like versus animals, you can see that animal brains, they have vision, motor control, navigation, survival. Um, that's the same in the human. So the, the green is the human ca um, capability. We've got that animal capacity. Uh, we can manipulate indexes and um, an index is what Pavlov was testing for, ring a bell and the body can respond to that with training um, to salivate. Uh, so humans have probably better index manipulation. Uh, word recognition, I can call my dog, it recognizes it. So we've got better word recognition. Uh, so when you do a lot of the analysis of animals versus humans, we finish up with this idea that the symbol ma manipulation is the difference. Humans have symbol ma manipulation, um, animals don't. Uh, and where you're going to see that is in this example. Uh, if you've got Beth and John flew to London yesterday, uh, we recognize that Beth's an entity, John's an entity, they both flew, they both went to the same place. Uh, and then you can add information, um, they ate a snack, that's an index, they is referring to Beth and John. And depending on the sentence uh, and the conversation you're having, they will refer to something else. Um, she carried a briefcase on the plane. This is referring to Beth. He had his backpack. That's referring to John. It was large. It's referring to something. Uh, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. So, so the, the, the challenge that we have, and this came out of um, Charles Sanders' purse, uh, is the indexes are one of the types of signs that we deal with. So when you say he, uh, yes, it's something that's male, but it's not a single thing. So the idea of um, creating word vectors doesn't work for indexes because it's referring to different things. Uh, whereas eat, for example, is a, a predicate. It's some sort of activity. That's a, a symbolic concept because eat is referring to whatever um, in the language we have the convention for. Dog is a kind of animal. It's a category. IBM is a particular company. Uh, it's a group of people and processes and things. Uh, so symbol manipulation is hard and we need the scientific model to work correctly. So let, let's have a look at indexes and symbols. Um, here's our system. I'm just running it on my machine here. Um, uh, we'll just, just step step through the examples. I, I'll make uh, a couple of key points here. So um, last time we 
we talked about the complexity of, let's just run them all while I'm talking, uh, the, the complexity of um, recognising language because we embed things. Not sure if that's big enough. So the horse race past the barn fell as a garden past, uh, a garden path sentence. I'm sorry, my headphones are repeating all of this to me, which is a bit annoying. Uh, so we've entered a piece of context. And then if you ask the question who fell, it was the horse. What raced? It was also the horse. Did the horse race? Uh, yes, it did. So you can get the correct answers. And when we look at the context and the reason for that um, is because we've got the uh, somewhat complicated breakdown to look at. I'll, I'll show you less complicated ones um, in the next example. So, so the point is that uh, even though that's something which ChatGPT didn't understand, uh, the technology is available with NLU to understand that now. Um, so, so here's a, a just run them, run them all again. Um, Beth arrived. She saw Sam. So we're resolving she. He kissed her. We have to resolve Sam. Um, Sam is he. Who was kissed? Beth. Who was Sam seen by? Beth. Did Beth see Sam? Yes, she did. Who saw what? Beth, Sam. Beth saw Sam. Who arrived? Beth did. Did John leave? I don't know. So it's always important to have some sort of test to make sure that uh, we've recognised everything. Uh, so, so in in this, when Beth arrives and she sees Sam in context, what we're doing here is she saw Sam has that particular meaning. But when I view the details, you can see Beth saw Sam. We've resolved the fact that it's Beth, and that location pronoun because it's a location um, argument uh, is being resolved correctly. So we know that Beth saw Sam. So um, simply recognizing that that's an index and resolving it uh, in the conversation means that we can have lossless use of pronouns. It's not a percentage uh, correct. It should be lossless and it should be clarified with a, a question if um, we don't get the right answer. So let's just have a look at one more uh, example here. I think, um, uh, let's see, results of this one any easier. Uh, oh, so this one's considerably harder. Uh, <laughs> Beth and John flew to London yesterday. They ate a snack on the plane. So this this is the one that I... Um, showed you in a in an image before. So here we're resolving they to Beth and John. Then she carried a briefcase on the plane. We're resolving to Beth. He had his backpack. We're resolving it to John. It was large. We're choosing from a snack, a briefcase, and his backpack to be it was large. So the backpack was large, and we're using um, I think least recently used algorithm in that case because it was the last it that was identified in that conversation. Um, is that the right approach? Well, the only way to test this is add more and more tests until we get um, enough validation that, yes, it's understanding everything we throw at it with accuracy. If not, we need to revise our scientific theory. Okay, so th that, that's that's showing you some... I'll just uh, stop that. So, so you can see it, it resolves correctly, and that's uh, why we're... I'm focusing on the science so that we can do these things. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit more about the science because it's it's really at the crux of the issues that we have today. You know, where um, a Turing Award winner is saying that um, the most modern AI system based on deep learning is producing um, uh, invalid facts, falsehoods. Um, that's not good. And uh, there's a few different techniques and there's people in the loop. Uh, that's not good either. Um, so uh, where did this AI problem come from? Well, I'd like to point out that cybernetics is possibly the better model to be using um, rather than the artificial intelligence model. Uh, cognitive science is the, the science where you start with how animals work and you build out from that. Um, AI is looking at how you can take whatever technology you've got and apply it to emulate um, uh, what cognitive science does. And cybernetics is a, uh, is a uh, interesting system that I, I think is modeling the brain um, pretty accurately. So here's AI. It's a computing model. Um, that's what I'm asserting. Um, and it uses this input process output concept. It might use it in different stages, but that's the fundamentals behind it. Um, so, for example, the input, if you take a corpus, you then use your transformer process, uh, it outputs word vectors uh, based on the transformer model. 
uh, if you used um, uh, the early ones, er, earlier versions of um, uh, these vectors like glove, um, it would be using the same type of thing, but its word vectors uh, would give you the same um, the same vector for each one of the um, tokens, each one of the uh, letter sequences it finds. Um, if you've got text strings and you put it into GPT, into a transformer, its goal is to give you the next, the predicted next word. Um, in audio, if we're doing uh, speech recognition, um, a hierarchical um, a hidden Markov model can, uh, one of those systems can then take the sequences of sounds and using whatever uh, language model it has at the back end, which is word sequences, it can then resolve um, again with text prediction what uh, uh, that sentence means. But it's based on the prediction of statistics, not um, based on meaning. Cybernetics has this model where you've got these sen senses, sensors coming into some controller and then the controller can take action and that feedback loop um, allows the system to control um, itself through that constant feedback. Uh, and on the right hand side here you've got the, um, the model that um, is pattern theory where sensors connect to the brain and the brain's doing the object recognition, selecting actions and recognizing events uh, and it can use that to control uh, muscles. So it's the same type of model whether it's pattern theory or cybernetics. Uh, so what, what else have we had in science? Well, a lot of people say, let's just go back to good old-fashioned AI. Uh, and the problem with that approach is that good old-fashioned AI didn't work. Uh, it, was, it became a rules-based approach. Um, lots of clever things were done. Uh, and um, the issue ultimately, I think, comes back to if you've got to write millions of lines of code, uh, it's very hard for people to do that. Um, and when you're trying to model things that biological brains are doing, uh, brains are doing it in pattern theory by this hierarchy. Um, and if you have no hierarchy, then you're leaving it to the programmers to work out a whole lot of stuff on different levels. So for example, um, when light hits your retina, it's, um, um, it's then converted into both the black and white image, you know, the rods and cones, and then it's going into the brain of the V1 area and the occipital lobe, which then projects onto these other regions that can pick up motion and color and so forth. And then it's projecting forward into the temporal lobe where um, those elements come together to do object recognition. And then it's going through um, involving the hippocampus to set up long-term memories and the frontal lobe to um, handle what I would call predicates, the, the relationships. Um, between the objects that uh, your brain is recognizing. Um, so if you're trying to do all of that with a, a program, a simple program, that's not good. And there, there's so much variety that you can choose. Um, it's a very arbitrary solution. And so to avoid that, um, perhaps we emulate the brain. Um, and th th this was one of my 2000 pattern theory models where it, it simply uh, is illustrating the number of different modalities that we have to use in order to recognize the language. So, you know, up here we've got the visual recognition of letters. Um, you have to have the sequential versions of those for spelling. And then that's got to connect to the auditory connections where um, the auditory sound of the letters can be pronounced, but also the, uh, can be recognized and also pronounced. Uh, and then the words themselves can also be recognized and then, um, uh, pronounced as well. So so that, there's a lot of stuff in it. That would be uh, not a lot of fun to code. So with the, the failures of that and then the, the struggle with getting computational models to work as well, um, artificial neural networks looked like uh, a quick win and it was better than um, the model where humans were doing the statistical compilation and annotations. Um, but But ultimately, it's excluding the sensory input and it's a processing model where um, somebody goes and annotates, initially annotates a lot of documents, it gets processed and produces output. And you can, you can build those reverse uh, training loops in order to get the system to produce what you expect. Uh, but it's not been reliable enough for things like language. Uh, so um, the, I think the, the reason for that um, is word vectors. Uh, so the, um, the word vectors like word to vec or glove, um, which were the, the first ones, and, and then um, 
uh, that eventually evolved into um, transformers, um, thanks to Google. The, the trouble is that a word vector isn't enough, it's lossy. Um, lossy in the same way that audio can be lost if you put it on a record player. Um, you, you don't want loss. So um, its big claim to fame was that you can do these analogies like king is to queen as man is to what? You know, woman, it would generate that sometimes. Boys to girl as man is to what? Again, woman. Um, the, the, the trouble with it is that it's based on the idea, the premise that uh, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. It's a, a very old concept, again, from 1950s or before. Um, J.R. Firth made the mistake of saying it and or write, writing about it in the 1950s, and he's, he's been stuck with that, um, that concept. But uh, J.R. Firth didn't mean that the meaning of a word can be determined can be determined by the proximity of the other words. Um, but that's been taken to about as far as you can take it, I think, now, um, where uh, in a transformer, if you say bank, you have to look around it for words like um, river. And if you say a word like river, it'll become a word vector that's representing um, a river bank rather than if you see a something, I don't know, involving money, it'll resolve it to something like um, institutional bank. Uh, the, the trouble is that's not how language works and you have to actually resolve those things in context and you can easily come up with examples where um, you know in the single sentence you've got both a river and the institution and money uh, and a person has no trouble understanding what that is but these systems will simply um, generate a particular vector and that's what it means. Um, you, you also know that when when you ask a person about this um, you know what does what is a king if they get the right sen sense and they're not talking about a chess king, they'll say, oh, it's a person who's male, who's a monarch that runs a country. What's a queen? You know, if you ask it straight away, it's a woman that does that. So, so when we're doing this analogy, king is to queen as man is to what? Um, you've got both of them people, king and man and queen. Uh, you've got king being male, man being male, and you've got queen being female. So if you take that difference between king and queen and apply it to person, person that's a female that's a monarch um, uh, is going to be analogous to woman. So it's, uh, it, it's possible with a lot more accuracy to do this with a system based on semantics, the science of meaning in uh, linguistics, than it is with these word vectors. And we're seeing the, the flaws now as we push this technology harder and harder. Um, and, and what I'd say, uh, you know, at the very beginning, uh, Beth Carey was talking about how uh, people are discussing uh, that it's harder to do things where you're trying to get information for somebody from another resource. So it's easier to have a chat than it is to have this chat and then go and fetch information from a database. Uh, and um, the, the intent model that chatbots are based on um, wasn't that good, you know, saying, well, here's an intent, this this particular value, and then you ask the developer to enter hundreds of ways of a person saying that to hit that intent. That's uh, not a very accurate way to program and get results that then navigate amongst uh, those intents. And what we really want to do is what language does. So if you said, what did you pay for your new red convertible? That what question is giving us the money amount? What did you pay for? So you need to uh, address what that what is referring to and in this case what did you pay five thousand dollars for in that case it's the goods purchased so um, this is um, quite possible this is possible this is how our system works so we can simply use this as we go forward um, basically providing addressing for language so that uh, we can then get information from external systems if we need to uh, what's understanding um, i think uh, I, I discussed this last time uh, when we talk about visual understanding, this is not just a picture of an elephant. Uh, there's a massive amount of information available and all of it's important if we want to build AI or um, cybernetics that is acting like a person would act. Um, so in this case, there's so much you can see. There's trees in the background, grass uh, in the foreground or nearby. There's a puddle of water. There's mud. There's an elephant throwing mud on its back. All, all of that is... is um, detectable by a human and that's what you want your vision system to do 
if it's not doing that, it's not human-like, it's not animal-like even, because my guess is lots of animals can um, recognize elephants and their motions. You know, it's not charging at you, for example. Uh, the sun's over to the left somewhere. There's, there's a lot, lot of information in that. So if that's what understanding's about, being able to pick all the things that a person can pick visually, uh, with visual understanding, um, how does that work for... Ah, how does that work for a sentence? Well, um, let's uh, go to the the demo again. This is my uh, last demo for the day. Uh, so take a sentence like this. The tall man raced the red, white, and blue car into the garden today because he was happy. Um, so if we use the meaning matcher to break that down, uh, you can see it generates a lot of stuff. It's a little bit daunting the first time, but I wasn't giving you a trivial example. Um, so we, we've got this layered model. We've got um, the, the predicate, which is raced, because we're saying that, um, where is it? It's the man that raced the red, white, and blue car into the garden. So um, the meaning of that I'll just highlight the key bits. Uh, the man does some. The tall man does something which causes that red, white, and car, red, white, and blue car to move, uh, and the manor is racing. Uh, and let's see, it, there's a process involved where um, the red, white, and blue car finishes in the garden, and the reason is because he feels happy. So all of that stuff is part of its meaning. We need to test for all of that. Um, so if I were to look at the tall man, what does it mean? Well, I've got here a definition for tall. So the man is tall means great in vertical dimension, high in stature. Um, and, and that should be uh, generatable depending on which language we're um, doing this query on. It's not a, it shouldn't just be text like a, dic um, a dictionary is. Uh, red, white, and blue car. You can see when we drill down into that, we've got a color, which is red, white, and blue. If I drill into that, uh, we've got these three properties. One is that it's got a red color, a white color, a blue color, and then we've got um, its resolutions, its uh, definitions over there. So when we say understanding, we want to be able to test things at this level. This is the breakdown of sentences, and we want to do it at another level um, where you're using it in conversation. And if you ask a question which is addressing a particular element of it, like who raced the wet, red, white, and blue car, it'll come back the tall man or John or whatever the tall man um, is being known by at this point. Um, yeah, so in the layered model, we've got the predicate, we've got its arguments, we've got um, an argument which is a destination, a goal, um, we've got when it took place today, and we've got the reason. And all of those elements should be tested and validated for the system that you're using, uh, and that therefore, because that's meaning-based representation, it should apply to any language you want to apply this to. So there's our demo understanding the sentence. Um, so what does this new NLU industry look like? Well, it's based on understanding meaning. So we're going to make language addressable uh, and we're going to keep growing languages. So uh, in, in that last example, the same principle as vision, you want to recognize everything um, and test everything. So we're going to identify everything in a given language. Um, and the, the way you do that on scale to build this new industry is you write specifications to say, this is how this particular predicate class works because predicates determine arguments. So if you define your predicate classes and your arguments then um, intersect to be validated, um, that specification can be used to guarantee the output of your system if it's working correctly. Uh, that the same principle was used by IBM in the 1960s with the System 360 architecture. So we're abstracting away the architecture in a specification document, and if that works, um, then uh, users can expect the system to work as intended for their particular languages that are supported. Um, step two, test everything identified and pass. Um, use the language, use for language science. Um, so if, if you look at things like chat GPT, it doesn't work in the classroom. Um, people don't use it to say, understand um, the, the words and phrases that they're using. They can use it for, um, for different purposes, but nobody would say that that system's reliable enough to decompose um, sentences and their meanings. Um, and I don't think people are capable of doing that with accuracy, you know, as, as you saw with the example that I had on um, a few minutes ago. 
if you take a complex sentence and you look at all the things that um, need to be validated for uh, for language understanding, you don't want people to do that because firstly, it'd take an hour for a, sim a, a simple sentence and secondly, there'd be errors in it. So this is a great op opportunity for automation. And if you teach the language science with these systems in the language that you're working on, that's going to make it accurate. Uh, and then you can use that system that's already been tested for accuracy with what you expect it to do for language learners. And so if somebody's uh, learning English, you can give them breakdowns of the language that they're seeing and they can learn from that. Uh, if you then want to learn German, you could then use the German example and either translate from English to German or do the German breakdown. Uh, what you're doing is you're taking the, the basic engineering, testing it at one level, then you test it at another level that relies on it, and then um, we can use that for conversation with machines. So for uh, corporate applications, which basically rely on all of those other things to be workable enough, we're now building momentum as uh, we've got a very good base platform being tested by scientists and engineers to make sure the system works as it should be and then you're starting to flow through into language learners and that's got to be right too then you flow through to corporates that definitely has to be right and so we're, we're simply making the system more and more robust um, and because it's working in a meaning format it works for uh, translation and um, dictation and i was going to say so, john um, that that ties back yes. to what you were talking about early on or at the, in the introduction about the concept of this 100% accuracy. And it, right. it's a lot, yes. not lot, because it's not lossy, as you, in, in, to use your words, you showed in the last demonstration, drilling down to, under the covers to show that every piece of information in a sentence in context is being stored. Exactly, yes. Um, and and that's that that's exactly the point. So we've got this complicated thing to do because nobody says language is simple. Any language is simple. They're all ex, uh, as complicated as they need to be to describe the universe. But uh, by following this methodology, you're you're doing things that are useful um, to help scientists with the theory and to predict. You know, people like Walid Saba. I want to give him the system and say. Um, what things should it be doing and then get the system to do the things that he wants to see with either his techniques or with others. Uh, but as long as we keep putting into the into the hopper the information that it needs to do and we keep testing it and getting it to to pass at that level, uh, you then flow through with with accuracy on scale um, to the point where it then starts being used for um, for enterprise. Uh, and uh, I'll get to the to the real goal here, which is not only is it used for enterprise for conversational interactions with people, uh, but then it can be used as our repository so that the meaning dr drives communications around the world in any format that you want, either spoken or written. And that addresses the continuous growth. You're continuously growing this system. You're not retraining it. You're incrementally growing its knowledge like a like a child learns their first language, you don't throw anything out, you build onto it, whether that's exactly legal concepts yeah. or medical concepts later on. Right, right. And, uh, um, you know, the demonstration we, we did for um, the, the medical example of um, interleukin 33 really hits home that uh, th this, this will scale to that. Uh, and if you want to do it correctly, you start at the bottom, as a child does with simple sentences. And as those simple sentences are used to reinforce that this is how the language works, you can then um, continue to expand on it. Uh, and the advantage that we have here is this is what's explain fully explainable AI. Every single step is, um, is able to be uh, monitored and measured and changed because it's a program. You know, um, it, it, it's a program where the, the hard work's done by the computer, for sure. You know, we've automated it so it's using pattern theory on a computer. Um, but as a human being, I wouldn't want to do what the machine does because it's just way too complicated and lengthy and boring. And um, you mentioned it too, that it's language, it doesn't matter which language it is, it's um, because it's storing in a super knowledge graph, to use your words, format at lossless format 
and it can generate, yes, well take in, can take can take in in any language it knows about and generate in in a different language. Exactly. Yeah. So so I've got a couple more things here, which might um, just a couple more diagrams that might cement that home. But but that that's the great point that we're really looking at. Uh, what will it take for this system to be the one that we use in a thousand years time? Um, is it possible that it will be the one? Um, well, what we're doing is we're emulating the science of role and reference grammar. We're using the uh, using Panem theory as a brain-based model. Uh, we're combining those linguistics and um, neuroscience together to produce this, uh, and it's working on a computer. Um, so, so there's our goal: build it to use forever. Um, and yeah, a thousand years is a long time. Um, be interesting in a thousand years' time if people were to look at this, um, whether or not things have progressed way, way beyond what you'd expect. A thousand years is a long time, so probably. Um, John, the slide's not showing. Oh, you're not seeing the... No, that's better. <laughs> ah, good. So, um, yeah, what I was saying here, uh, we want to build it to use forever. So in a thousand years, um, it's still being used. And um, obviously, if we're, um, if the meaning repository is done right, and it works for the world's current languages today, as language evolves, it's not a big job to continue to evolve our system. Uh, because today's languages are extremely diverse as it is. Um, and so our goal is to replace text-based storage with meaning-based storage. And um, in the diagram in a moment, you'll see why. Uh, in fact, let's, let's find it. So this, this diagram, you might have seen it before. Um, this, this is breaking up um, how language works into the, um, the syntax on the left-hand side here. The, the words and phrases, um, you know, the vocabulary and the phrases in a language are used to convert into meaning. Uh, and the meaning are um, based on these building blocks, the word senses, and then they're combined with predicates into their relations. So the, the blue bit on the left is language specific. This green bit on the right is language um, independent. Uh, and so these word senses are the centralized function that then can be used to go back to any language. And then, uh, as Beth pointed out, the super knowledge graph um, is storing context correctly, the context of utterance, where things that are written by the New York Times by a particular author on a particular day and time um, can be referenced in a lossless format, um, not not with the types of issues that we're seeing with ChatGPT. Because um, if you're modeling how language works, then uh, you should be able to extract it and generate it into a target language. So um, here's what the enterprise is going to look like. I'm just drawing the same thing on the left hand side. We've got the words and phrases um, and then we've got the um, the global dictionary and the publishers. So we, we start with uh, a dictionary. So this is simply storing the, the meaning representation, not in a language, but it's the relationships that apply uh, based on what semanticists teach us languages are built on. Uh, then companies like Cambridge Press, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, other journals, books, magazines can all be published referring to the semantics there. Uh, and to automate it, you basically have the language um, which is being curated for each of the languages. We've got English and then, you know, the, these are ones we've actually tested, Spanish, Korean, Mandarin, Japanese, German, Portuguese and others. Uh, there's no reason we can't simply create these words and phrases in a respective factory, uh, integrate it with the common factory for semantics to allow people to publish things in a meaning format to then be consumed by uh, any particular language. Um, and just to, just to finish um, on that note, um, all of these references um, will be available on the um, uh, in the comments section. I'll just show you one um, one more thing which I think helps illustrate um, the, uh, the 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 process examples where um, in in the YouTube videos you can see the uh, the function. Let's see if I so I think about the video set. Um, 
you can you saving information mat matching patterns and store in order to um, uh, another video here is is showing how we're uh, breaking down and extracting elements um this is looking at singular and plural examples so so that the decomposition of words into their meaning components is is demonstrated there um, I'll, I'll show you this one which is uh the first, um that we um, got 100 percent against in 2017. Um, this is the process it was using where we would get uh, in the in the test a sentence like john traveled to the hallway we'd break it down based on its elements um, and then we would store it in context. It looks like um, YouTube isn't enjoying running a live stream and also displaying this video. Let's see if we can skip and uh, get this to work. Okay, well, uh, on the positive side, uh, when I was showing you the live demo running on my machine, it was running quite happily, but um, I'm overloading um, my internet link here or YouTube to um, to display this, but basically this video here oh. you can see as as it's entering John Travel to whatever. Yeah, um, maybe we just maybe I'll drop that. Oh no, it's responding now. Um, that's a bit annoying. Um, so so all it's showing is that as we're entering things, it's going into context, and then when we ask a question by simply identifying what element the question applies to, uh, it's then able to do this thing called intersection, find the, the difference, and um, by passing that information to the generator, you're getting a response. Uh, drop that completely. It's probably I think be the bandwidth... Losing me as well the bandwidth if it is actually my God's, internet link. I think the bandwidth got God's John are telling us that it's time to wrap up. <laughs> well, and what a good time it is to to wrap up. Were there any other uh, things that that I've forgotten to mention today, or um, I think it's or over is that, to uh, just the, the right time to finish up. I think it's over to the viewers of this recording um, to leave messages, questions in the comments section underneath and John will respond to them. But um, we'd love to hear from you, you. keep the conversation going and um, we'll see you next time. Right, bye everyone. Thanks for joining bye us now. today. Bye.